Music theory pedagogy has recently undergone a reckoning. This reckoning is perhaps best exemplified by the College Music Society's Manifesto for Progressive Change in the Undergraduate Preparation of Music Majors, published in 2014. Soon after this, several responses were published by numerous music theorists, including a group of SMT members led by Jenny Snodgrass in 2015. Around the same time, there was a surge of attention given to student-centered critical pedagogy, such as that highlighted in the article, Hacking the Music Theory Classroom, by Phil Duker, Anna Galboy, Chris Schaffer, and myself. Publications such as Engaging Students and the Journal of Music Theory Pedagogy have championed this sensitive and critical approach to teaching, and importantly, have presented this research in open access formats to ensure its availability to all. SMT's 2019 plenary session, Reframing Music Theory, was, for many of us, a watershed moment galvanizing the need to create a more diverse, equitable, and accessible field for our colleagues and students. This has led to a concerted effort in the music theory community to, at the very least, update our pedagogy, if not completely rethink it. Despite this recent enthusiasm, however, relatively few teachers are prepared to discard their textbooks. Textbooks released by for-profit publishers are rigidly structured and the field's dependence on them hinders the creation of a more flexible, inclusive, and accessible curriculum. There are additional limitations with traditional textbooks that impede learning in the theory classroom. One, they are expensive. A potential barrier for lower income students and non-college teachers without a large textbook budget. Two, they lack the advantages of an open digital format, such as immense customizability, or potential for computational pedagogical approaches. Our session promotes open educational resources for building a more flexible, inclusive, and accessible music theory classroom. Through five lightning talks, we demonstrate how to use one particular OER, the new second edition of Open Music Theory, to dismantle the barriers described above. Videos of each of these talks have been made available for your viewing pleasure, and each of these talks will include a live workshop or discussion component during our SMT session. The format of our session will be interactive and collaborative, and therefore, in addition to viewing these videos, we hope that you'll attend the live portion of our session on Sunday, November 15th at 11.30 a.m. In our first talk, In the Trenches Using OMT, Kyle Gullings dives right into what it's like to teach music theory using an OER. He discusses the potential fears that one might have in adopting an OER. These include the challenges faced by non-specialists who are used to having a complete packaged textbook and workbook the impact on student satisfaction and success, and ultimately, the huge savings given to students by adopting an OER instead of a proprietary textbook. Chelsea Hamm discusses Open Music Theory's secondary school outreach and support of AP Music Theory. Her talk highlights the ability for open educational resources such as OMT2 to reach a wider audience. In order for our discipline to change, we have to reach non-theorists and non-college teachers. AP Music Theory teachers face numerous challenges, large class sizes, the burden of intensive grading, a lack of student background and training, and the minimal funding in support of achieving their curricular goals. Chelsea argues that OMT2's current quality controlled content, instructional text and homework, interdisciplinarity, and interactive online format provides a solution to some of these issues. Megan Levengood's video, Not Just a Theory, How to Put an Egalitarian Music Theory Curriculum into Practice, shows how flexible digital open educational resources such as OMT2 are essential for a modular music theory sequence. Megan emphasizes the importance of such curricula in creating a more diverse and inclusive pedagogical environment. She argues that OERs are vital for the development of new curricula for two reasons. One, OERs, especially digital OERs, are more easily updated to fit current research and pedagogical goals. Two, OERs are easily adaptable to suit your course, which is especially important if you're designing something with a different focus than what might be found in a typical music theory sequence. Finally, Megan discusses the importance of a digital community, such as Humanities Commons, in providing the support needed for teachers when using an OER such as OMT2. Spaces like Humanities Commons offer the ability for teachers to share strategies and resources such as additional classroom examples, tests and quizzes, things that you would not likely find in the textbook resources published in a traditional format. Our final two lightning talks showcase the flexibility and extensibility inherent in our digital OER. 
In Assessing for Retention, Modeling Creative Multi-Use Quiz Design, John Peterson and Brian Jarvis discuss the use of online quizzes as a means of creating an interactive experience for students that attempts to mimic the back and forth nature of an in-person class. They provide a pedagogical model for scaffolding lessons using these quizzes, followed by a demonstration for how to easily build the materials needed for these quizzes so that anyone could adapt this approach in their classes. Finally, Mark Gotham's Tutorial in Computational Methods for Augmented Anthologies shows us the potential for computationally derived anthologies to provide both the student and the teacher with a broader selection of repertoire examples, rather than simply relying on the few tried and true choices presented over and over again in printed textbooks and anthologies. Further, Mark provides a tutorial for generating analyses which may then be used in larger computationally driven classroom assignments, projects, or even research. Of course, these analyses may also be used to build our corpus of repertoire, keeping our class anthologies up to date. The discussion of these aspects of our resource will reveal the importance of open education to our project. These materials and methodologies can be freely and legally copied, edited, and repurposed depending on the needs of the instructor. This provides elements of flexibility and future-proofing that are not available when using traditional resources. We don't intend for this session to merely come across as an advertisement for our updated edition of Open Music Theory, though we would certainly be thrilled if you checked it out or even adopted it. Several other of our music theorist colleagues have developed excellent open educational resources recently, and we'd be remiss not to mention them here. Ben Geyer's Music Theory in Mind and Culture and Stephanie Acevedo and Toby Rush's Music Theory 21C are both freely available and distributed under permissive licenses. Further, the often cited musictheoryexamples.com, musictheoryexamplesbywomen.com, and musictheory.net, while not OERs, remain essential free resources for our work. Importantly, we hope that this session encourages our community to take a hard look at our support of the for-profit textbook industry. In 2014, the United States Public Interest Research Group published a report that shows students routinely decide against buying course materials because they are too expensive, that these costs impact their decisions about which courses to take, and that they feel they would do significantly better in a course if the textbook was freely available online. What we want you to bring away from this session is an understanding that OERs can be rigorous, flexible, and accessible and that all of these things are of the utmost importance for music theory pedagogy moving into the future.